Welcome everyone. First Media Lab talk of the year. Um, I'm Kate Darling. I'm a researcher here at the lab. I am excited and slightly terrified to be next to Douglas Rushkoff here today. I, I first heard about Douglas from our lab director, Joey Ito, who said, I quote, Douglas is braver than I am. Which, if you know Joey Ito, I mean, the, the guy who invented the Disobedience Award at MIT, that's pretty high praise. So, uh, for those of you who don't know him, Douglas is a fairly prolific media scholar. I think your website says media theorist. Although, like, looking at his work, I feel like media is defined probably about as broadly as we define it here at the Media yeah. Lab. Um, he's written, how many books have you written? Depends if you count graphic novels. Oh, wow. If you do, then it's like 20. But otherwise, it's like 15. That's, well, okay, yeah. either way, an inhumane number yeah. of books, um, including the book that we are talking about today, Team Human. So I have a signed copy of Team Human. It has a snarky inscription. Um, you too can get a signed copy of Team Human if you like after this talk. We're selling books back there. Um, and if you're watching this on the live stream and you're in the lab, please don't do that. Please come here. It's much nicer in this room. You can get a book. You can hug Douglas if he'll let you. Oh, yeah. Ask for consent first. Um, come join us in the atrium. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. If you are watching on the live stream and you can't join us here today um, and you want to participate on social media, there's a hashtag. I think it's up there, hashtag MLTalks, and you can ask questions on Twitter because we will, the way this works is we're gonna talk a little bit about the book and then um, we'll open it up to a broader conversation. We'll take questions from the room and also some questions from Twitter that I'll sneak in probably to Douglas's chagrin because I know you prefer in-person questions. Yeah. But well, please here. ask questions on Twitter. I'm a big fan of Twitter questions. So. Um, Douglas, we go way back. <laughs> we, we go way back to last September when yeah. we first met. Uh, I met you in New York. You were about to give a talk, I, and I did not know who you were. And my baby like crawled up to you and tried to knock over your water. I think yeah. that's how we started talking. And I just, I remember that conversation just being struck by how warm and kind and mild-mannered you were. Like, just really nice. Oh. And, and then, <laughs> then I sat down to watch your talk, and this nice guy just launches into this, this most powerful, passionate, angry speech I had ever heard, and I like almost choked on my wine because I realized who you were. I realized you were Douglas Rushkoff. Oh, and the courageous guy. <laughs> the brave guy, oh, brave. yeah. So I, like, I feel like the reason I didn't put two and two together is because it seemed like such a contrast at the time, this like fiery rhetoric and your demeanor. Mm. But looking at your work and, and reading this book, I actually feel like it makes a lot of sense that you are both nice and angry at the same time. And that like maybe we should all be a little bit more of both of those things. Um, and I do wanna get, I, I'm hoping we can kindle some of that fire here today, uh -huh. but um, I, actually, I actually wanna start with the warm and fuzzy side. Okay. So you, you're not jaded about people. Your book is called Team Human. Like, don't you think people are kind of terrible? Like, what, what gives you so much faith in the human race? Well, what else am I gonna have faith in, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, I certainly think people can be corrupted. I think people can become uh, addicted to systems, to operating systems that they're not aware of. Uh, I think they can, they can sometimes see invented things as given circumstances of nature and then respond accordingly. You know, if you're born into a competitive, angry war game, you're gonna think that's, that's the world. Um, but no, I don't think, uh, I, I think human beings are just confused right now. You know, and I can watch almost anybody, I mean, uh, think of the darkest people in politics today. I mean, uh, uh, 
I can watch almost any of them and see the human being there. You know, I can have, have I don't know if compassion's exactly the right word, but I can, I can see the person struggling, trying desperately to establish rapport in a world where they don't know how to engage with other people and all. But yeah, when I, when I look at, at the story of human civilization, what I see is a, a story of our efforts to, to collaborate and coordinate and work together and forge solidarity and rapport with each other. And then how fear or capitalism or something kind of turns those things against us or against that, against that effort. But uh, yeah, I have to. I mean, if, if unless we believe like that some savior is going to come down, some duke sex machina thing and, and fix it, then I've got to believe it will come from, from humans. And, and I think our, our current lowest, low sense of self-esteem we have as a species is largely manufactured is largely a result of living in a dehumanized landscape. And I think our, our big problem now is we're having trouble understanding people in any terms other than our utility value. And I'm, an old, I'm a Mr. Rogers kid, right? I was told that I'm special just the way I am. And you could say that that's, that's you know, a sick boomer illusion, but if you don't, think that there's some essential merit or worth to humans. And if you don't have the experience of establishing rapport, seeing somebody's pupils get larger and feeling the mirror neurons fire and the oxytocin go through your blood and bonding with another person, and then you don't understand where our power actually comes from as a species, where the whole thing derives. And then, yeah, sure, you're going to end up being one of the billionaires building a, a bunker in New Zealand. Oh, uh, tell that story. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That was the thing I did that talk about was I, I had uh, I'd been invited to do a talk for what I thought was going to be this like, group of bankers about the digital future. And it turned out to be five billionaires who they brought into the green room to pepper me with questions about like, how they should invest their money. But eventually the whole conversation turned to where should they put their doomsday bunkers? You know, for the, for the climate catastrophe or the electromagnetic pulse or the social unrest that was gonna come. And they, they were spent the majority of the time on the single question, how do we maintain control of our security force after the event? because they know their money's gonna be worthless and then these guys will have the guns and be more powerful, so should they have a combination to a lock? That's what one of them thought. I'll have the only one who has the combination to the food. It's like, that's really, it's a recipe for waterboarding, you know? Or um, shock collars or other disciplinary techniques. So I decided to, you know, I mean. Did they really say shock collars? Yeah, yeah, it was that's, one of the, I mean, incredible. it was half facetious, so, so what do we do, shock collars? I mean, it was sort of more like that, you know, the, the it's where you, you, know, you have collars around the guys that if they want to serve you, they've got to wear these things so you can, you know, you'll be asleep. They'll change the controls. You just, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So what I was trying to tell them is they're at the end of a scenario that they're thinking about wrong from here. In other words, that rather than trying to figure out how much money they need to earn to insulate themselves from the world they're creating by earning money in this way, they could think about what about making the world a place that they don't have to insulate themselves from. But that's the, that's the anti-human bias that's so embedded in, really, in our technology culture today, in digital culture, and that's because digital culture is built on an unrecognized operating system of corporate capitalism, which has always been about getting humans out of the equation. You know, it isn't just digital companies that wanted fewer workers because they can't scale if they have humans. It isn't just digital companies that think we have to use all of our technologies to manipulate people um, rather than serving people. So it, it's much older than that, you know? And that was part of my trepidation coming here is I don't want particularly MIT Media Lab people to think that I'm railing out against technology. I love technology. If anything, I'm disappointed in what we did with technology because I really believed that the internet could have helped us practice um, collective intelligence, you know, collective awareness, collective activity could have helped us not do it, but at least be training wheels for, uh, uh, you know, 
at the time in our little psychedelic world, we thought, you know, for the guy in mind, you know, for the global neural pathways to emerge. And um, we just surrendered it so fast to the market that uh, uh, we're using it for the opposite. You know, we are not the users of the internet anymore. And we're not even the product, even that would be something. You know, we're the medium at this point. The net is playing us. We are the medium of, of our technologies. We don't use algorithms. Algorithms use us. We don't use our smartphone. Our smartphone, every time you swipe on your smartphone, it gets smarter about you and you get dumber about it. You know? And we can't even learn about the smartphone because the algorithms in there are protected by proprietary black boxes. So we can't even know the systems. Right? In an oppressive law, at least bad laws, you can see they're on the books. Oh, look at this bad law. Once the laws have migrated into code, they become subterranean. They become part of, uh, they become part of the operating system, and that's a little bit different. Yeah, what I really like about this, so you, know, you do talk a lot about technology and digital media in your book, and you know, I'm a millennial. I'm, you know, the, the cutoff for millennials is 82, so I'm barely a millennial, but I, I'm there, and I'm... I'm extremely online, as the kids say. I love social media. I met my husband on Twitter. We got engaged on Twitter. Like, Had I, you met him before? The, no, we met on Twitter. And you get, got engaged on Twitter, but you three met between. Later, three yeah, years later, three years later, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like I, I'm a huge fan of social media and like I believe that it connects people in new ways and in interesting ways and not just social media, like a lot of stuff that we do here, like from social robotics to effective computing to, you know, fluid interfaces. I, I think that there are a lot of things we do that connect people in new ways, in interesting ways. And so normally when someone, you know, a lot of the popular tech criticism out there, like what I hear is that Douglas Adams quote, you know, the um, anything that gets invented after your 30 is against the natural order of things and the beginning of the end of civilization, right? Because their, their argument is usually just like, look at that teenager absorbed in their cell phone. And like, th that's their whole argument. And, th and they sell books because there's a whole generation of people who are like, well, yes, clearly that's a bad thing. And it's, it's the same argument we've heard about every techno like new medium that's got, like people said that about books when, when they came about. Like, oh, the books are gonna destroy the kids. You know, the rock music's gonna destroy the kids, right? But your argument is different. Like your argument is not, a criticism of technology. It's a criticism of the systems that co-opt the technology. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm as annoyed as the next guy by this, this ra rampant uh, uh, sort of almost medium rhetoric that I see now. And I love, I write for medium and I love a lot of it, but basically it's by putting two sentences next to each other somehow connects them. So it's like, you know, Writers deserve to be paid for their work. You know, the Internet Archive can be clicked on by anyone. Okay. <laughs> w w you know, it's like, the, uh, I get you're upset. You know, and that's really the only response I can have. I got it. You feel threatened. You're upset. But it's like, you're not making sense, <laughs> right? Um, there's a day that for me shall remain in infamy. The day that Netscape went public, right? Netscape was an operate, uh, 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 a web browser that was actually based on Mosaic, and Mosaic was done at, what, Champaign-Urbana, I think it was at University of Illinois, shareware, right? Netscape went public on the same day that Jerry Garcia, the guitarist for the Grateful Dead, died. And for me, it put together something. For me, it felt, and I'm saying it felt, right? And this is another one of those putting two things together that are actually unrelated. But to me, those two things happening on the same day made me feel like the 60s communal, commonsing, uh, countercultural, cyberpunk values that I thought were going to be expressed by the internet were being surrendered to the, the needs of the sort of IPO stock market, that Wired Magazine won and Mondo 2000 lost, that the internet would be contextualized not as a cultural renaissance, but as an economic revolution. And an economic revolution really means we are not going to disrupt anything, 
When I read uh, Kevin Kelly's book of that period, 10 Rules, New Rules of the New Economy, it seemed extraordinarily reactionary to me. That what that book was saying is, here is how, even though we have this seemingly disruptive digital technology, you all can still make money the same old way by investing in things, externalizing your costs, extracting value, and moving on. So it's like, don't worry, the Walmart model will still work, and it does. We have Amazon, we have Uber, it's the same uh, it's the same rule book from the British East India Trading Company on how to go to a place and colonize it and form a beachhead, extract its value, enslave its people, and move on. And my hope, my naive hope, was that the internet, rather than being a revolution, it would be a renaissance, that it would retrieve the values that had been repressed in the original renaissance, the peer-to-peer -peer values and uh, local marketplaces and uh, all the kind of uh, uh, late medieval mechanisms that, that got uh, uh, sidetracked or repressed by central cap, you know, centralized uh, currency and chartered monopolies and the replacement of the city-state by the nation-state, all these kind of abstracted, scaled solutions to things. Um, but instead, the digital ended up being more about scale than anything else. And the problem, as I see it, is that human beings don't live at scale. We live, uh, uh, we live locally, and the planet turns out to be local as well. So we're, we're in conflict, and that's where you get these sort of throwing rocks to the Google bus situations where you have a company that has, is, on an abstract level is extremely wealthy, but in its uh, actual physical world operational level, it ends up being um, extractive to the, to the humans who are trying to coexist with it. So when I was reading your book, and it, it kind of starts out by saying, market forces depend on human predictability to operate, right? And so, so the market forces try to separate us for social control. And I was like, I don't know, Douglas, that's, that's a really dystopian view of things. And then, like, literally just last week, I was at this conference with, with a bunch of marketing data analytics people, and I had never really talked to people in that world before. They were all super nice, right? Um, but I learned so much. Like, I, I learned that that Gillette ad, like, they, they knew exactly what was gonna happen, and it was exactly what they wanted to happen. Like, they, they weren't trying to, like, make a political statement or anything. You know, I'm naive, right? I, I learned that I'm part of the 45% that pers prefer lime skittles to green apple. Um, it was fascinating. So, so I met this woman there, and she was great. She had this party trick that she could do where she could ask you three totally unrelated questions and tell you exactly what type of menstrual product you use. Like tampons, pads, she could even tell whether you use pads with wings. Uh, and it's because I found out, it, you're absolutely right, like the ad industry just, the, the menstrual product industry says there are three types of women. There are exactly three buckets, and they can f sort you into a bucket depending on all these attributes. And I was like, holy shit, like, that's a fun party trick, but you know, what's the bigger picture here? I mean, it's funny, because I kind of came up with this construction for that, that, even for that TED talk, the idea that, that you know, when the digital Renaissance, whatever it was, was emerging, part of what made us excited about it was we were excited about the, the new, the novelty. We were excited about the, the possibilities of an unbridled collective human imagination and what would that bring forth. You know, the, the digital future seemed like open terrain, infinite possibility. And investors don't want that. Investors want predictability. They hire scenario planners, some from even this very institution, I'm sure, and the Global Business Network, to tell them what's gonna happen so they can bet on it. You know, you want, if you're, if you're betting, you want the most predictable outcome. You wanna bet on, on a sure thing. So we've ended up, I feel, we've ended up using data and technology more to figure out where things are going than to have some impact on where we might want things to go. And especially those billionaires who saw themselves as so utterly powerless to influence the future that the best they could do was build bomb shelters to prepare for the inevitable collapse of civilization. I thought, wow, I feel more powerful than they do. Is that because I'm an idiot or because they're, they're 
so locked into, into their betting. So when I look at the, the primary use of algorithms today or of big data today, when I look at Facebook, what I see is an operating system that uses data from our past to put us in a statistical bucket and then use um, uh, behavioral finance and machine learning to get us to behave true to our statistical bucket. So if they determine with say 80% accuracy that I'm gonna go on a diet in the next two months, they're gonna start filling my news feed with, hey, Doug, you're looking fat, or this is, the, this is what the veins of someone who's not you know, taking care of themselves look like. And they're not just doing it so that I buy a particular diet product. They're doing it to make sure I stay true to my statistical profile, to get that 80% up to 85% or 90%. So what, what they're actually doing and I understand why, because they want to increase the predictability and ultimately serve me better if I want the thing that they've got, but what they're doing is taking that 20%, that, that, that Pareto principle weird factor and reducing it to 10% or 5%, or if they can get it down to nothing, they would. So what are they doing is reducing our, our novelty. They're reducing the one thing that humans have over Machines, if anything, is our 20%. Is that anomalous behavior? Is that unpredictable thing? If we're gonna cure cancer or solve climate change, it's not gonna be the 80% doing things the way we do it. It's gonna be the weird 20% who figure it out. So if we get rid of that, that's a problem. What is that 20% basically considered in our, our current technological parlance? That's called noise. Right? That's not noise, it's, 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 that's humanity. Right, that's, that's what I see as the thing. That's the quirky, weird thing I'm, I'm trying to, to promote and, and celebrate. And that's the part that seems soft and squishy. But I'm arguing that there's a weird, good reason to keep people around. This was the argument I got into with the famous singularity guy on a panel for CNN, and they cut this part from it, where he was arguing that the singularity is coming and people should accept that, that, that computers are our evolutionary successor and we should be humble enough to pass the torch to them and then recede and stick around as long as computers need us to keep the lights on and then accept our inevitable extinction. It happens. Um, and I was like, no, but people are special. We should be kept around. You know, a human being, we can sustain paradox and we can enjoy ambiguity. We can watch a David Lynch movie and not understand what it means and still experience it as pleasurable. What is that, <laughs> right? It's those soft, squishy, liminal, contradictory places, that ability to experience awe and confusion, that moment that the dog has. You, dinosaur didn't do it, but when you confuse a dog and it goes like that for a second and we go, oh, we recognize that human, huh? That's the part I'm trying to, to celebrate because I think that's where, um, that's where the magic of life happens. And if we intentionally stamp that out and we have machines that are really good at shaving that off, who we are, at automating our behavior, um, we will never be as good machines as our machines. They will never be human, but we won't really care. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried for the, the um, you know, when, the day that, that computers pass the Turing test, but not because computers will have gotten so smart, but because we will have gotten so dumb that we can't tell the difference anymore. So L Larry Lessig, um, he railed against copyright legislation for years and years and years and years, and he popularized this whole movement, the copy left movement with his work. And then after years in this space, he realized he was still just fighting this uphill battle and just getting nowhere. And he realized, oh, it's because the problem isn't copyright. The problem is our system of government that's so corrupt that I'm never going to win this battle. And so he shifted his focus to fighting government corruption. And so in this case, you know, how much of this problem is technology versus just unbridled capitalism? I, I don't really blame the technology at all. You know, I, I, technology does not want anything. I promise you. Kevin's wrong on that. But it wants for something in the sort of Shakespearean sense, W-O-N-T, it wants for direction or consciousness or intention. And that's what we would have to uh, 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 instill it with. You know, the the... We were just talking about, you know, dear, dear John Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace and how it 
was inspired, but it, it, it also inspired a wrong turn. You know, those of us in the early cyber days, we saw government as the enemy. And I remember fighting with Larry Lessig about this because they had done Operation Sun Devil. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that where the government and the FBI went in and they raided the apartments of these little raver, you know, raver hacker kids who had, you know, someone broke into AT&T or someone broke into a shopping mall, you know, on the computer just to see if they could change the thermostat. And, you know, the FBI is coming in there with handcuffs and tear gas and we're all like, oh, fuck you, fuck the man, you know. And at the same time, it was like Tipper Gore era and they were doing the Computer Decency Act and they were gonna shut down websites that had dirty words and we were just like, okay. So then John Barlow writes the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace saying, governments of the world, beware, stand away, we will govern ourselves, we don't need you. And we got rid of government off the internet. But stupid little raver kids that we were, we didn't know that, that government and corporations kind of balance each other like fungus and bacteria in the body, right? You get rid of all the bacteria with antibiotics and your fungus goes nuts. Right? That was the same thing. So we got rid of government and we created this free space for corporations. We didn't know that they would want to come. The corporations hated the internet at that point. The average household that had an internet connection was watching nine hours less commercial television a week in 1994. AT&T was offered the internet for like a buck and they turned turned it down because they were like, what is, we don't want to have to maintain this stupid social thing that people are just talking to each other. You know, we've got to get back into commercial media. They thought it was, I mean, my first book on the net was canceled in 1992 because they thought the internet would be over by 1993 when the book was supposed to come out. I mean, that's how little and stupid they thought this thing was. So the idea that we were wresting it from the hands of government seemed uh, it seemed like a good thing, but no, it turned, out, it turned out to be a bad thing. And the problem is, it's not just the corporate capitalism on steroids thing, but that the young developers, they drop out of college before they've taken a civics class or anthropology or sociology. These are kids, they're 19 year olds. They don't even have the myelin sheaths fully formed on their, on their frontal lobe. And they're going, you know, so they're, they're, they have impulse control issues and they're already computer geek kids, right? They, and with impulse control going in and instead of having their, their professors as their mentors, now they've got some Silicon Valley guy in a sweater saying, here's how it's done. We're gonna get you VC, your company kid, and instead of being worth $20, it's now worth 20 million. And that sounds so good until they realize they have to pay back 2 billion. Right, the 100X is the problem. So now we're kid, we're gonna take this network for connecting people to people and we're gonna pivot just over here, just a little bit. It can look like that, but we're actually doing this. Right, so now your business plan is to extract value and data and whatever from people in the, in the great, you know, and sell this company before the data bubble pops. But they lose, they lose what they were doing. You know, so I don't even, uh, uh, and I gotta read Zook, I haven't, I haven't, read, I just read the beginning, but it feels like even that book, uh, McNamee's book, is kind of presenting Zuckerberg as a, as a naif, as an innocent, and sort of like Sheryl Sandberg and her armies, you know, corrupted this, you know, uh, this adolescent. Um, I mean, the, the Facebook's original purpose was pretty dark, but at least it was social. You know, it was, it was white male toxic social, but at least it was social. I feel like it would have been easier to pivot sick social toward healthy social than pure capitalism to, to healthy social. So you mentioned, you know, the young white male uh, aspect of this, and a lot of people, including myself, you know, would argue that more diverse people building technology or even leading technology companies would lead to better outcomes, you know, because people's work is so influenced by their life experience. And you know, if you have like a 20 something dude bro in San Francisco, who's like, oh, I wanna make an app so I can order pizza with one button like this. You know, and then you look at the history of technology that can't recognize dark skin from photography to the automatic faucets in the bathroom to now facial recognition. You know, it just seems that diversity in tech might lead to better technology, but maybe also to better business models. Do you think that that could be part of the solution? Yeah, I mean, we can blame capitalism for half of it, right? And they're uncon the fact that they're unconscious of capitalism. But the other half, I feel like, is this a, a kind of an anti-human agenda that seems to just be embedded, particularly in Western culture. You know, so I, I, I keep thinking about the Thomas Jefferson's dumbwaiter, 
You know, and yeah, he was a privileged white male and he developed the dumb waiter and we we're all taught that the dumb waiter was there to save his slaves on the, the, the effort of having to carry all the food up the stairs, but it didn't. It was just there. They still had to carry the food up the stairs. They, they, and, and through a whole like two mile tunnel from the real kitchen, the purpose of the dumb waiter was to hide the slave from the dinner guests. It was to externalize the labor so we don't have to see. So it was ultimately a dehumanizing device to make it look like slavery wasn't there. I mean, and that's Part of our problem is we have in America such a pedal to the metal, blinded, forward-looking understanding of technological development where everything that we've done to get to this point and everything that we're doing, that all the externalized harm is behind us. You know, it's all back there. And there's almost, there's, for all the memory in these devices, there's no sense of memory. So we make movies about robot slaves that have a revolution and kill us. Where do you think that fear is really coming from? It's from a nation that was built on slavery and still hasn't acknowledged where the heck it came from. You know, and it still hasn't, it hasn't looked that, even that far back, much less at the exhaust pipe sticking out of the back of you know, every one of our lives and as, if, as if you can go forward with it. So I feel like capitalism is a big problem, but there's also a more fundamental problem with, with, with any technology that we develop. And I would go all the way back to language and text that all of these terrific uh, potentially unifying or collaborative technologies and languages and media, um, if we're not aware of the, the affordances of that medium, we end up at the mercy of the medium rather than in control of it. And technology, digital is just the latest one of them. You know, when we got text, you could look at the invention of Judaism, say, as a society trying to deal with the potential downsides of a world of text, of a world where we're gonna have a history and a future. You know, they, they, re, they remake their relationship with God into a contract, a covenant is what Torah is. They write down laws because they're looking and they're saying, oh, wait a minute, when we start writing things down, now people are using text to keep track of their slaves. It's the first thing we did with text. People are lying in text. They're writing contracts that they, then they don't follow. Um, so what if we try to develop laws that are gonna codify? I mean, they were really trying to think about uh, you, can, you can, and I have, you can analyze even the Ten Commandments as these are the things that we're gonna need to deal with as we move from an oral culture into a textual culture. It's, it's kind of interesting. And they understood what was gonna happen. They understood when we move from an oral culture to a written culture. A lot of the rabbis were, were so upset that we were gonna write this stuff down. They said, oh no, people aren't gonna remember the stories once they're written down. People aren't gonna have to, learning the stories won't be a communal event. So then they made a rule and said, okay, okay, we'll make it so that if you read Torah, you've gotta to have 10 people there, a minion, to try to reinforce the social fabric of it. So if we had been that conscious, developing radio and television and the internet of, okay, what are the biases of this medium? How are they gonna change the way we relate? What are the, what, what uh, ethical, presumptions about humans might these technologies not recognize and how can we compensate for that? You know, that would be a very different path. But I feel like we're developing this stuff on top of operating systems that we don't even understand the biases of them. And we're just building on and building on and building on. And uh, we need to disinter some of the, the, uh, uh, the biases and embedded values. You know, and I would argue that rather than rejecting technology, all we need to do is retrieve essential human values and embed them in the technologies of tomorrow rather than um, uh, forget them utterly. So when I asked you what you wanted to talk about today, I know that you mentioned you know, that artificial intelligence and technology might be interesting. You know, we're at the Media Lab after all, but there's actually another part of your book that was really fascinating to me. It's just a little part, but thought it was really relevant to our here institution, and that's the part about education. Mm. Um, you know, what, what is education? Yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about that because um, I've been teaching myself for four or five years, and I have all these kids coming in and their parents all about what job can I get when I study media studies? You know, what, what's the job? And public education, I teach in a public university, public education was not developed for job readiness. Public education was developed as compensation for people who had 
to work all day. The idea was that the coal miner was working in the coal mines all day. He should be able to come home at the end of the day and have enough education to be able to pick up a novel and appreciate it. That even though he's a coal worker, he should, have, he should be able to live with the dignity of a thinking, conscious person with real cognition and thoughts that are valuable. And plus, if we're gonna live in a, in a democracy, they need to be able to read the newspaper and be informed enough about the issues to actually exercise the enlightenment value of, of voting. And instead now, we've turned the classroom into job training. We have C CEOs meeting with high school principals and college presidents who are anxious to find out what skills do you need our students to have so they can get a job in your company? Do they need to know Excel spreadsheets? Should we teach them that? Or do they wanna know Python or Java? What do you need? And we'll, so the classroom is a way now for corporations to externalize job training rather than being these, these dare I sound too, too idealistic, these sacred places where young people get to, um, through mimesis, get to uh, practice what it is to learn with a capital L. You know, and that's where, I mean, I got into Horkheimer's Eclipse of Reason. The, it's a great small book where he's arguing about, and this is old from like Frankfurt Group, it, where he's arguing that there's this sort of capital R reasons that we do things are like the big, almost kind of, uh, 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 almost platonic valley. I don't want to talk about because it it's really more Aristotelian, but it's a long story. But the, the, the real ideals, the reasons we do something versus being reasonable, the little r, utilitarian reasons. And that's, it's, we've started to think of education in a utilitarian way in terms of inputs and outputs. How am I making a, a more, uh, uh, how am I optimizing these people to be workers in the economy of tomorrow rather than how am I enhancing these human being, this, this human being's ability to experience uh, uh, dig, the essential dignity of being, of being human? And uh, it's just, it's so funny that even that now is almost considered elitist or a luxury. Oh, you're not the one who needs to get a job when you get out of school. Um, it's kind of, this, there's an ass backwardsness in that. And I use that as sort of one of the main examples of this reversal of figure and ground, how human beings have become the objects of our reality rather than the subject. And that's, that's a dangerous place uh, for us to be. And it's just not, a, it's not an appropriate way for us to teach each other and be with each other. Can you just like explain the figure and ground concept for people who aren't familiar I mean, yeah, figure and ground, it started, it was, I guess, a Danish psychologist. It was that, that famous picture of, that could look like a, like a goblet or it could look like two faces looking at each other. And some people see the goblet, some people see the faces. So it's, it's sort of a test in a way of whether you're seeing the figure or the ground, the, 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 ob, the, the subject of the picture or the landscape in the picture. And you know, you want kind of a healthy balance where you understand the ground and you understand the figure, but I use it really as a way of describing this kind of profound reversal between people and their technologies. Like when I think about the internet of things, I think of the human beings are the things, right? We're the things in the internet of things that, that are actually being uh, uh, tracked and ultimately manipulated. Okay. So that's not the only, so education is, is one that you kind of um, unravel there. There are a bunch of constructions that you talk about in the book that we kind of just take for granted today. And um, this might actually lead nicely into the AI discussion because my favorite part of the AI chapter was talking about automation and jobs. Because you know, all day I hear people being like, oh, are the robots gonna take all the jobs? Or are they not gonna take all the jobs? But you peel back an additional layer of that and you're like, well, what, what even are jobs? And so you say about jobs today, they're not a way to guarantee that necessary work gets done, but a way of justifying one's share in the abundance. What do you mean by that? Well, what are, what are jobs for right now? I mean, all politicians always talk about, let me get people more jobs, more jobs, more jobs. I mean, who really wants a job? A job. <laughs> When were jobs invented? Jobs were invented, we talked about that, in the transition from medievalism to, to Renaissance capitalism. People used to have small businesses and then those businesses were made illegal, so they had to get employment, they had to get jobs. That was the first time since slavery that people had to be, uh, uh, sell their time. They're actually, they put the, they talk about uh, technological determinants, that's when they put the, the clock on the tower in the middle of town to make it look fair, that you're selling your hour instead of selling the bread or the thing that you made. You know, when, when, 
I hear, and originally it was, I was listening to Obama and Bush and all those guys talking about jobs and creating more jobs for people. And I was thinking, why do they want to create jobs for people? Is it because we need more stuff? We need more work done? We're tearing down houses in California because they're in foreclosure and we don't want the market prices to go down. The USDA is burning food every week in order to keep market prices high and trying to, you know, it's, what? You know, so why can't we let people live in those houses or have that food? Well, they can't have it or live there because they don't have jobs. So then we have to, what, loan money to a, to a bank to give it to a corporation to build a factory to create plastic doodads that nobody wants, so they have to hire an advertising agency to create demand for this crap that people will use and then throw into the ocean and starve the fish that we actually want to eat, all so this person could have a job, right? And so there's, you know what I mean? And if we're just trying to program a fix, a kludge to the existing system, then digital technology will come to the rescue, right? And create jobs, oh, task rapid jobs, or these jobs, we'll make jobs, we'll create jobs, it's okay. You know, we'll pump out jobs if that's what you're looking for. So I was like, I don't want a job, so what if we look instead at, at, at rather than, I mean, it goes to a whole lot of possible economic arguments, but let's think about what actually needs to get done. And if we don't have enough jobs, then we're gonna have to share the jobs so that everybody can have the experience of, of contributing, you know, but the fact is we're not really near a jobless future. If we were, then we wouldn't have to like send kids into caves in the Congo to get rare earth metals. We wouldn't have to leave mercury and landfills in China and Brazil. You know, if we, it, we wouldn't have to destroy the topsoil in the next five or six decades. You know, if we had more labor intensive, careful practices in our production and agriculture and everything else, you know, we might actually get to stay alive as a species, you know, so it, it, there's not even a shortage of tasks for people to do, but uh, we consider jobs another thing, you know, you wanna limit the number of bodies that are in your company so that you can scale infinitely and sell. You can't sell a company that has people unless they're programmers, and even then the aqua hire is kinda, that's, that's kinda faded as well. So yeah, there's just this, this th that's another figure and ground problem, it's this, uh, ask backwardsness that happens if we don't interrogate the underlying assumptions of the problems that we're trying to solve. Yeah, so what about AI though? Should, should we, I see people constantly trying to create AI systems that, you know, are a replacement for human intelligence that can perform human tasks and we want to automate human jobs. Like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends what we want the AIs to do. You know, okay. I mean, seriously, it does. You know, an AI is going to try to do whatever you tell it to do. So, if if what's the perp, what's the function of a car salesman? Is it to get someone in the car they need, or is it to get someone in your in your company's car? You know, and those are two different things. I don't like AIs being told to get people to do something. You know, and that's language I've been trying to avoid since I, would, uh, since I talked to technologists at the beginning. How do we get people to do this? Even well-meaning, lefty, liberal, whatever, how do we get people to care more about the commons? How do we get people to, you know, and that, that whole construction is, again, is, is it's objectifying the person. So when AIs are about that, um, then no, I mean, if an AI wants to drive me around or run my subway or something, yeah, if it's safe, <laughs> sure. And if it's gonna make a calculation whether to kill the rat or the squirrel, you know, because um, it can steer and kill one of the, uh, you know, sure, that's a problem that, that. You don't have a preference, rat or squirrel? I do, but I don't know where the actual, I don't know where, for me, I think it's prejudice. I think the rat's actually, isn't a rat smarter than a squirrel? Even though a squirrel's cuter? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's so the AI can figure that out. Um, cool. I just want to ride on the subway and drink my beer and, and, and read the paper. You know, leave me alone. You figure it out. I mean, but yeah, I mean, because that's a painful choice I don't want to make. <laughs> well, so, okay, so, you know, we're, we're at the Media Lab. Um, we were talking a little bit before this about how, you know, I know that there are a lot of students in this building who do care about what happens to their technology, you know, after they've created it. And they do worry about, you know, I told you about a student who was worried that McDonald's was going to get their hands on this educational toy he built for children and use it to exploit kids. And so, I guess the big question is, you know, what can we do about that? You know, should, 
can we lean into the positive sides of technology? Are there ways to design it in a way that's less likely to be co-opted? Should we give up and go home? Is it possible to get it right in today's capitalist system? Are there examples of people getting it right? What, what do we do? I mean, there's so many ways to get caught up or to take a weird wrong turn. I mean, one of them is a lot of times we design technologies before we have a use for them. And that's a tricky one. I mean, and it's not to say we shouldn't do pure research. I mean, we have to. Sometimes it's just cool. How do electrons spin and how does this work and all that. But it's like, we'll, we'll, I love watching, um, nothing against blockchain, but I love watching blockchain conferences because so much of it is about what, we have this ledger, what task can we retrofit it to that will do social good and not allow this and not allow that. And sometimes I feel like we've got these, we've got these toys that we don't know how, uh, we don't know how to use even. We don't, let's try some of this, try some of that. Um, you know, it's almost impossible to, uh, in, in the current landscape, it's almost impossible to develop technology that won't be used also in some other way. So but do we go higher up? Like, is it a political thing? Do we have to... I think we go lower people? down in some ways. I mean, if we keep interrogating the operating systems beneath what we're doing and look, you know, what is it that's fueling my lab and letting me to do this? Who am I working for? Um, what, what control am I giving up as I, you know, as I develop this thing forward? That's where... I mean, it's, been, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a case by case basis. You know, right now we are developing digital technologies with an industrial age framework. And that's not gonna work. This is not the fourth industrial age. It's not the fourth, it's something else. You know, the industrial age is about one size fits all scaled solutions to whatever. And part of the beauty, if you remember the early cyberpunk era was how distributed this was. Was this homespun, I've got my own computer, I've got my own, thing here, I got my own server. You know, there was a, um, and it wasn't about, I'm gonna, I mean, I mean, I know it's the good old days. We did share, we shared our apps on the back of the school bus. That's, and you wanted six other kids to you to play your friggin' maze game, you know, and maybe it would get to the neighboring high school, you know, and this was on paper tape, you know, I mean, back in the day, and they would play it. I mean, and that was the original, that, that excitement of the way you knew if what you had done was good and worthy was if a lot of people were using it. You know, and that was, that was kind of the point. And it's a, uh, It, it doesn't really translate anymore into, well, the way you know it's good is if VCs have given you enough money to force your cab company into this town that really doesn't want it. I mean, you know what I mean? This is no longer, it's sort of the natu a natural uptake of, of technologies. But yeah, I think if you, if you start by looking at an actual human need and then think, how can I address this need with technology and actually engage with people on the ground, because, I mean, I, I work a lot at, at Civic Hall in New York, which is a very well-meaning place where lots of independent people come in and develop these civic technologies. But I'll talk to a guy. It's like, oh, I'm making this, you know, app for homeless people on the street to be able to use blockchain to get durable identity over long periods of time. And it's like, if you talk to anybody about this, and it's like, finally, they launch this thing and they talk to the homeless people and they're like, I don't want durable identity. I'm hoping that I get out of this and no one remembers who I am at this stage of my life. Don't, don't. Put that to me, or I'm trying to use the benefits of two different shelters at once, so I got two different IDs. You know, don't mess with me, buddy. So, you know what I mean? So there's yeah, like- Yeah, so we're, we're not connecting with people enough. Again, it's- Right, and the, the techno-solutionist urge, even when it's meant as I'm gonna do something good for humanity, it still so often comes from the place of human beings are the problem and technology is the solution, and that's, that's troubling, really. You know, right now, in most people's experience, technology is the problem and human beings are the solution. You know, and that's, that's the, the mindset, as a prejudice as it may be, people are, people understand that from the Vannevar, well, they won't understand it in these words, but Vannevar Bush 
went to Eisenhower and said, your colonial expansion is not gonna work anymore. You can't grow capitalism on the backs of the third world, but I have a new territory for you to colonize, and that territory is gonna be virtual. It's gonna be this computer territory. This is gonna be the new industry that lets the American economy expand. But what we didn't realize was that you can't actually colonize the internet. You colonize human attention. You colonize human data. You colonize human cognition. And that's what's been colonized and people don't feel, uh, 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 I don't anyway, like I have enough time of the day in my own head or with other people. I feel you know, at, the, at the mercy of these algorithms that wanna figure out what kind of menstrual pad I use. You know, and they're, they're not, uh, if it was just surveillance capitalism, if they were just watching me, that'd be one thing, but they're not just watching me. You know what I mean? They're tilting the very landscape to influence my behaviors. They're changing the world. It's like they're, it's a Truman show where the internet that I get, which is everything at this point, is being rendered in real time by algorithms that are trying to get me to behave in particular ways. And that is a weird world to be walking through. And it's a world where, because I can't really see that, I don't distrust the simulation. I distrust, distrust the other people. I distrust the other people because I can't establish rapport with them anymore because they're not looking at me because they're walking down the street staring in their phone or because I'm only seeing them in Skype where I can't see their pupils get bigger. I can't establish rapport and I don't blame the technology. I blame the other person. And that leads to a kind of a feedback loop of increasingly uh, dehumanized uh, developments. Well, we are in a room with other people right now. We can connect, and I do want to open it up to some audience questions. We have this question box, which if you haven't seen it before, you just throw it to each other. And so if anyone would like the box, it has a microphone in it, so please speak into the box. And let us know who you are. Um, my name is Arne Hessenbrook. I teach innovation here at MIT. Um, you describe my problems, you describe my mother's problems, you describe my children's problems, you describe my uh, granddaughter's problems. Um, but at the same time, half a billion Chinese have been lifted out of poverty since Jerry Garcia died. Isn't that more important? So wait, I just want to get the two things. So but, but give it back to him though. So <laughs> how are your grandchildren's problems and the Chinese getting out of poverty connected? No, what we're talking about is um, our attention being lost, um, the um, dehumanization of, of our world, um, all the, the values that we had as kids are sort of disappearing. Um, that, that's something that we in this room can all agree to because we're rich. We're the rich guys, all right? But there's a world of poverty out there and there's half a billion Chinese just to represent them and that's not the only ones. They've been lifted out of poverty while we've been losing a, a tiny bit of our um, quality of life. So which one is more important? So, and, you, and you attribute the Chinese Wealth to AI, to Facebook, to Google, to what? Sure, to, to electronics and uh, to, to the electronics that's been assembled and uh, the whole, the, the globalization of the system where, where all of a sudden there's a lot of work in China uh, where people can get paid that wasn't there 30 years ago. I mean, it's an interesting model. All right, so let's say, and it's possible, white Western culture has run its course. We've been bad. We killed Native Americans. We enslaved the Africans. So maybe the appropriate and ethical step for us to take is to create technologies that make us suffer and maybe end our civilization, but our consumption of these technologies creates wealth for uh, the Chinese who are assembling it. I mean, maybe, I, it's, it still feels to me a little bit like a zero sum game that I don't know if we, it's sort of like saying, okay, all of America is addicted to heroin, but 
We're buying, buying the heroin from these Arab and Chinese countries that are growing the poppies, and they're getting out of poverty as a result. And fuck it, you know, we're, we're kind of bastards anyway, so let that happen. You know, I could, I could buy that as kind of a, a civilization-wide penance, but I think we're also in danger, and this is just me and 99% of scientists, I think we're also in danger of destroying the planet itself. You know, and I, I don't know if arresting the American psyche in an effort to save the Chinese economy through industrialization is the easiest way to, to, to fix things. But no, I see it. I mean, the, the real thing I would say is, you know, for however much I hate Facebook for Americans, you look at how Facebook or crypto are being used in Africa, it's quite exciting. You know, in Africa, they just call the internet Facebook. That's how they get on, and that's how they do, you know, money transfer and find out about jobs. Women use crypto, you know, with here crypto is an investment scheme, and in Africa it's a way for women to make money and hide it from their husbands, so they can, you know, rather than having it beat out of them when they get home. So uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways that people who have uh, more genuine needs. Are, are, uh, or more direct needs are using technology in ways that, that we can't quite imagine um, because we're using them uh, for entertainment. But at the same time, I feel like our, uh, our use of technology in this way is paralyzing our ability as a, a kind of a, a civic guided republic and potential uh, uh, catalyst for, for positive global change. I feel like it's distracted us from that purpose. I don't feel like America, other than maybe through the purchase of Chinese industrial goods, which that's still poisoning the planet, um, I don't see how we are actively, positively contributing to uh, uh, you know, some kind of global harmony. I feel like we've, we're, we're descending into kind of, uh, in some senses, digitally induced nationalism and borders and you know, uh, a, a very binary, polarized, dehumanized way of seeing the rest of the world. But sure, I mean, some of what I'm talking about are white people problems. Some of what I'm talking about, though, are, are species annihilation problems. Where'd the box go? Thank you. Uh, I'm Neil Mawson, I'm the PhD student in uh, Patty Moss's lab, Fluid Interfaces. And my question is about cyborgs. Uh, where do you think they will fit in Team Human? Imagine in, in a decade or so, we will integrate with AI, so every individual will have su superhuman abilities. Like, so uh, how do you see that unfolding with the current operating system of the society? The, you, the, the who did you call them? Cyborgs. Oh, the cyborgs, the human cyborgs? And I mean, well, you know, I mean, I always thought of like a person with glasses as a cyborg, right? Um, it's sort of the beginning, you know, or, um, I think it's always a, ma a matter of balance. You know, different people can tolerate different levels of enhancement before they kind of lose their center of cognitive gravity. And that's sort of what we're, we're gonna see is where, how much can you do, how quickly, before the person tips you know, <laughs> into, into something else. So it's gonna, be, it's gonna be interesting. I mean, I don't think that the, um, Some of it, which is interesting to me, some of it is about reacquainting people with the physical world, which is interesting. Like the people who put a little sensor on so that buzzes when they're facing north, you know, and it's like, and they experience it as really, uh, as, as this kind of a grounding thing, or people that have a little shock or something go off when they're just about to go into, uh, just about to fall asleep so they can sustain the liminal state between waking and sleep. I mean, that to me, those are cyborg, Enhancements. So I'm more interested in cyborg enhancements that um, kind of extend the nervous system and my perceptual apparatus than I am in ones that extend my, my uh, supply of fixed data. You know, so having the Spanish language, you know, the Cassell's dictionary here is not as interesting to me as you know, these, these almost more humanities, artsy kinds of uh, uh, 
extensions. But I mean, I do think we're gonna have some fallout. You know, it's, it's the same as with, with pharmaceuticals. You know, and, and the, again, I think the guide should be, and again, this is, might be, you know, white western guide, but it's a guide, is are we correcting the individual for the values of society? In other words, are we giving the person a drug so they fit into a sick, depressed, extractive society? Are we drugging 30% of, what is it, 30% of America's on, on SSRIs now or something? I mean, are we drugging because there's a, a systemic problem that needs to be addressed, or are we actually enhancing in an interesting and fun, uh, fun direction? And that sort of, for me, will always be the, uh, the litmus test on whether I'm kind of interested in the thing. You know, if we're just gonna increase somebody's utility value by giving them the claw, you know, so now they can, you know, I mean, sure, if you like that, but, but you know what I mean? That's the part that starts to make me think of the human is the, is the, the canvas rather than the, than the artist. Uh, actually, I'm gonna t take this Twitter question because I think it'll infuriate you. Um, <laughs> What do you think of the concept of voluntary obsolescence, where humanity is slowly phased out in favor of a new conception of what it means to be human? Team human strikes me as needlessly adversarial. Like, I, I'm, I think that's a transhumanist, don't you? I guess, I guess. I'm adversarial, needlessly adversarial. In other words, it's interesting construction. Why not just accept that humans are going obsolete? Right, my argument to retain a place for humans is adversarial to those who would replace us. I get that, it's sort of like creative destruction, right? The robots come and that's a creative destruction and the people go. Um, no, I don't, think I'm being, I don't think I'm being adversarial. I think I'm arguing that we're not good enough at programming yet to take into account all of the weirdness of humans. I don't believe that we yet know everything that happens in a square centimeter of soil. We're only now getting scientists and everyone to agree that soil is alive, that soil is a matrix, that trees use soil to pass nutrients to one another, and there's, you know, the, the, the mycelia are more, uh, more adapted and advanced than us and, and keep us alive. So there's so much about us that we don't yet know, that I'm concerned that the Xerox copy that we envision, even with its improvements, may leave something out. You know, I still feel, again, controversially, like there's something about uh, record albums that CDs don't capture, even at 44,000, uh, uh, whatever they are, um, cycles, we'll call them, at a sampling rate. Uh, and it may be everything, it may be all you need, but, um, and that when it finally comes down to it, it, it sounds almost a uh, uh, theist, but I, I, like Aristotle, I believe in the human soul. I think that there's some kind of pre-existing something about us. I think we come in with value, that we don't have to prove our value. And uh, until we really resolve a lot of questions about the quantum fields and all, I'm not willing to, to let us all go. I think that the human project is still in its adolescence. And I will admit, in the 21st century, it is considered adversarial to argue for a place for humans in the future. That's adversarial. And if it is adversarial, then I understand my work, my work is, is important, right? Because I am arguing for a, a, play, a sustainable role for humans in our future, at least for the next couple of hundred years. I think it's worth keeping us around, more than three or four of us in a zoo. I think, and I think that losing you know, several billion people to climate change as things move on would be a catastrophe, a bad thing. People on the other side of the wall in Mexico are humans. They're not just MI-13s or whatever they are. They're, they're human beings. And uh, so yeah, but um, I don't mean it's like, team human is fighting words, I guess, right? They say, you're, uh, we are, you only say this because you're human, it's like hubris, and I say, yeah, fine, you know, guilty as charged, I'm on team human. And that's kind of something fun to fight for. You know, it just, it's kind of fun. Uh, 
where I come from, old fashioned, humans are kind of, humankind was sort of this given that we have this role. I think we have a unique role in nature. I think that we're the only ones who are self-aware in the way that we are. And I think that we can be sort of planetary stewards. I think we can make nature less cruel. I think that we can bring uh, meaning to existence. And I don't yet have faith that uh, the rapid deployment of digital technology um, in the name of uh, uh, the next kind of human is being done with the care and precision, with the understanding of the underlying biases, with, with any consciousness of capitalism and the rules and what we're embedding the technologies with. I don't think that we're wise enough to build the next species, you know, as, as, as worthy as, as we are. Well, I'm human, so thank you for fighting for me <laughs> <laughs> and for all of us. Uh, we are over time, but you know, pick up a book, get it signed. I'm sure we can hang out for a little bit more yeah, in yeah. this room. And please give our guest, Douglas Rushkoff, a big hand. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.